a priest performs a public ritual. He bestows a child, named Toru, with a power from the gods through the skill tree. He lifts the crying child in a basket, announcing his skill which is restoration. Toru, already grown up, catches a crawling slime in the goblin's forest entrance. He slashes its slimy form with his knife. He then impales the slime's core, containing a dark fluid. Toru pulls out his knife, as the fluid splatters, however his knife corrodes due to its acidic property. Unbothered by the situation he simply casts his restoration skill. His knife is immediately restored like brand new. Toru uses a vial to catch his twelfth fluid as it drips from the slime. He senses a presence nearby. Suddenly, a beast blows up beside him. He notices a group of adventurers using magic. He jumps to dodge the slashing beam, heading towards his way. He looks at the slash tree. While holding the creature's debris, the adventurer notes that he only intended to stun it. He blames Toru for messing up his magic. His party notes that Toru frequents the location to hunt slimes. Annoyed, the leader rudely calls him names. He points out Toru's unscathed weapon and armor, concluding that he only aims for weak monsters. They leave Toru alone to go deep in the forest, to hunt real monsters. He ignores them while he closes the slime liquid container. 39 years ago, Toru was given a skill to restore anything an ability enough to bring his corroded knife back to its previous state. Toru can only use his skill on monster-related items, making it useless for combat. With this, he can't move past the forest's entrance. Toru is back to the border town Daten from hunting. The gatekeeper, calling him an old man, teases his hunting, but the other guard calls him out. He nonchalantly shows his lowest G-rank badge to the annoyed gatekeeper. He suggests that he retires and be like him instead. Toru calmly passes the gate. The gatekeeper just sighs in pity. Toru goes to the subjugation assessment counter. He presents the vials of mud to Merica, the receptionist, but she is confused while holding the vials. She reminds him he is at the subjugation assessment counter. The adventurers he saw earlier arrive, confirming that mud collection is also a form of subjugation. However, they try to bully Toru by taking his spoils. The adventurer tries to grab his vial of mud. However, Toru abruptly knocks his face. Enraged, the leader attacks him but he smoothly dodges his punch, causing him to crash into the counter. The fluid splashes into Merica, startling her. She calls the guards. Ina, her boss, calls her out. Then she thanks Toru for the vials. Ina reminds Merica to be careful around dead slime's fluid, even if harmless. The latter tries to reason out. Ina asks her to clean up while she takes over. Suddenly, Toru grabs the spilled vial. He uses his restoration skill to bring everything as they were. The vial pops closed while Merica is startled. Merica gives him 90 copper coins for his completed subjugation quest. He grabs a sack containing his reward and leaves for the butcher shop. He hands the dead mole to the butcher. She commends the clean kill he executed. This helps her peel its skin off easily. As usual, Toru sells half of the meat to her while he keeps the rest. The butcher hands him the wrapped meat. She whispers that it is the usual bonus and reminds to keep it a secret from the boss. Her boss tells him to get back to work. Toru walks in the night streets. He stops in an alley and unwraps the bonus from the butcher on the ground. They are innards for the stray cats. He pets them as they eat. He notices something. Flashing eyes hide in the dark. He notes that the third cat still will not come out. He decides to leave since the other cat does not eat when he is around. He then walks away. He arrives at Ural's boarding house. Toru gives her the horned mole's meat. Ural, who is an elf and a landlord, expresses her gratitude for him. Exhausted, he collapses into his bed. He recounts his monotonous life. When in bed, he turns to the closet. Then he checks his skill points, using his badge. He is suddenly roused. After learning he has gathered enough points from the subjugation, he looks again at the closet and slowly opens it. Inside is Sora, his childhood friend, in a state of suspended animation. Sadness envelops him, recounting the events 25 years ago. Monsters from the Great Abyss invaded his village. They mercilessly ate the townspeople. Toru, Sora and the priest rapidly escaped to the hidden passage. Suddenly, a flying beast came after them. With a deft maneuver, Toru managed to defeat it. He was relieved when he caught his breath. While celebrating early, a giant mantis crept from behind. Fearfully, Sora warned him. Instinctively, she used her body to shield Toru from the mantis' surprise attack. He was startled while she was covered in blood. The priest expresses his anger. He stepped in between Sora and the mantis as he casted stagnation. He explained that he put them in suspended animation. Toru shivered in shock. He noted she was not dead yet. He carried her as they continued to escape. In the temple, Sora was in bed to treat her. Concerned, 
The healer could not cure her with the water god's power while in stagnation, but if they released the spell, she would die instantly. Tor expressed his frustration. His grandpa, the priest, suggested a solution. He was eager to know. He revealed it was his restoration skill. Frustrated, he protested he could only go back for 10 seconds. Not to mention, it could not work on living things. But his grandpa explained it was possible. He only needed to raise his skills level. Toru was dumbfounded, revealing he could unleash Time God's true power at level 10. Same with his stagnation skill. Toru felt the sudden burst of hope, but his grandpa warned him of a challenging path ahead. Nevertheless, Toru was determined to save Sora. However, the suffering was just like the priest said. He needed to defeat monsters to increase his level, but he had no combat skills. But a gatekeeper pitied him, so he taught him how to wield a sword. Then he was able to hunt little by little. He noticed many beginners earning points. They also joined parties helping them to level up. At the age of 30, he mastered the art of evasion and counterattack. In an unfortunate invasion, he lost his left hand's strength upon saving a child from monsters. Due to this impairment, it became harder for him to raise his level. Presently, as he looks at Sora, he is unsure if his wish will come true. However, he keeps working hard tirelessly. His weakened left hand tries to feel her face. This gives him hope to keep going. He sits on his bed, while he contemplates. He meditates and enters his mental realm. It is believed that every human soul is born with a natural skill tree, giving them the opportunity to perform miracles. So far, he gathers 10,000 skill points in his water jug. He pours it to water his skill tree. A flower slowly blooms as his level increases. At last, he reaches level 10. His restoration skill unleashes its full potential. It returns targets involved in battles to their past conditions. He is speechless to see his skills modifications. His restriction changes from target items only into targets. He clenches his hand. He recounts his grandpa's reminder about his skill. Looking at his urn, he notes that his ashes and stagnation skill remain. He opens the urn and tries to use his improved restoration skill. However, nothing happens. As he expects, he confirms that the gods of creation cannot restore deceased souls. He then decides to use his skill on his left hand. Wincing in pain, he sees visions of when he wounded his hand. He is confused. In his mental realm, he notices a hanging fruit on his skill tree. He suspects that he gains additional ability to see his target's past. He discovers the time continuum perception. This displays the target's time sequence in detail. An arcane fog envelopes his left hand. The result renders him speechless. He clenches his hand, feeling the blood flowing. He expresses his contentment. He discovers that he can use his skill even with his gloves on. He immediately prepares for his next target. Tora goes to Sora in the closet. His heart loudly pounds as he pleads the skill to work. He casts his spell on her. The continuum perception is in effect. Sora remains in suspended animation. He thinks nothing happens. Until her lips twitch, he is dumbfounded. Sora's eyes come back to life. She regains consciousness while feeling confused by her surroundings. She comes out of the closet and looks around. He offers to explain, making her grateful. Tora explains that his grandpa put her in suspended animation to stop her fatal injuries. He continued her treatment, but it took him a long time. She asks if his grandpa passed away, and he confirms. She absorbs the information. Silently, Tora does not think she recognizes him yet. He contemplates restoring his young body to make his identity obvious. However, he notes that he will remain an old man inside. After thinking, she remembers something. Sora asks if he noticed a boy next to her. He thinks about his response. He decides to lie to her. Toru thinks it is the best decision. She giggles in the corner. Apparently, she is only pretending not to recognize him. Noting that he has not changed his habit to scratch his chin, he is in disbelief. Sora gives him a hug. He asks her when she starts to recognize. She says from the beginning. Still skeptical, she reassures him. She explains her awareness of his grandpa's stagnation ability, and he recognizes that only Teru's skill can undo it. She cries on his chest, recounting what happened. She expresses her gratitude for Teru. He comforts her, thanking her for being alive. They share an intimate hug as they reunite. While crying, she notes that he has outgrown her. Toru confirms he is now an old man. She expresses how proud she is of him. He tries to keep humble. Then he asks her to eat, but she fell asleep on his chest. He admires her as he pats her head. The next day, Sora watches Toru as he sleeps on the couch. He opens his eyes. Immediately he rouses, while gently holding her chin. She assumes they will kiss. However, he is only checking in on her. Feeling disappointed, she turns back, informing him that breakfast is ready. 
He notes that she didn't wait for him to introduce her. Ignoring him, she leaves the room to tell the landlady he is awake. Sora is excited to eat her first meal after 25 years. Ural is amused by her. He apologizes to her for bringing someone from his hometown unannounced. She doesn't mind as they give each other favors sometimes. Also, as a former adventurer, she is happy to support a new one. Toru echoes her as he looks at Sora. She asks if she can be an adventurer. He dissuades her, telling it is a difficult job. She positively responds, wanting Toru's help. She finds the food delicious. Ural is pleased, noting it is a mole's meat. Silently, he recounts his goal, to keep Sora away from the past trauma. But he thinks twice, noting he is just getting old. While everything is new to her, after pondering, he tells her that they will register her to be an adventurer later. Sora is excited. He asks if they need anything to prepare. He also consults the landlady. Toru asks Ural if she can lend Sora her armor temporarily, until he gets a new one. She warns he has not used it in a long time. He says not to worry. She asks if it is really okay, noting the robe's yellowish color. Also, the breastplate is already rusty and has mold in it. Sora expresses her excitement, while Toru places his hand on the armor. He uses his restoration skill. The continuum perception takes effect. Instantly, her armor turns as good as new. At first, Ural is rendered speechless. She asks him about it. He explains it is his skill and apologizes for surprising her. Sora wears the restored armor and happily twirls. He seems to like his you. Ural thinks it fits her perfectly. They bid farewell to Ural as they head off. Toru and Sora walk in a crowded street. She drools as she sees so many foods, thinking it is a festival. He asks her to calm down, noting that this is an everyday scene as many people live in the old border town. She clarifies. To elaborate, there is a great chasm at the center of the world, called the Great Abyss. The overflowing miasma covers the land and creates many monsters, while the polluted area is called the Cursed Land, which is no longer habitable. That said, a base is created between the Cursed Land and Human's area to reclaim the Lost Land. Basically, that is how Border Land is created. Toru notes that there used to be troops stationed in the area. He explains that the more soldiers fight in a battle, the skill points become smaller when defeating monsters. Sora understands, noting the reason for a few elite adventurers. While they walk, Toru points out the adventurer's office. He tells her to enter alone. She asks why. He explains it is to avoid drawing suspicion. He reassures he will observe from afar. She feels silent at first. Like a child, she pretends her stomach hurts. She finds a reason for him to accompany her inside. He looks at him confused. They start to draw attention from passersby. He sighs and agrees to go with her. But he decides to make himself younger for once, about 25 years old. She dissuades him from changing his appearance. He explains that most people do not think highly of him, and this will cause her trouble. While sitting, she asks him if he did something wrong. He explains that it is shameful for an old man like him to remain at the bottom ranks. She passionately protests, telling she is proud of him. She reveals that she asked his landlady about being an adventurer. She encourages him, noting that it is no joke to be an adventurer for 25 years. If it is up to her, she will probably give up already. He clarifies even with his current age. She confirms, calling him a cool old man. He feels validated. She grabs his hand as they both enter the office. They read different requests on the board, such as one wizards of different ranks. Sora gets curious. While Tor explains that adventurers write down requests or party invitations on the contact board, she find it interesting asking if he tried it before. He confirms he never needed to use the contact board. The delinquent adventurers grin at him as they hang out at the table. Toru and Sora proceed to the counter. and Inag greets him, noting he is back so soon. He explains he is only tagging along with someone he knows. She enthusiastically introduces herself. and Inag gets curious and asks about her relationship with Toru. She innocently tells her they plan to be a married couple. But he immediately muffles her mouth. He explains that they come from the same village. And he takes care of her. And now looks at Sora's document. She clarifies her age, which is 17 years old. She asks her to touch the crystal ball. Sora gets curious. Anna explains it is a soul analyzer, allowing them to examine her skills. She places her hand on the crystal ball. Toru observes. He recounts witnessing her skill tree. He notes that he learned about it through continuum perception. Her skill is level 1, which reverses the target's attack or effect. She can use it 5 times every hour. The activation is through blank. Anna notes that a white trunk is rare. Additionally, she has not seen a reverse magic skill before. Sora recounts that she was the only one with this skill in their village. She explains that any attack bounces back if she uses reverse. 
However, it does not work on quick attacks. Toru and Sora both recount the time when she was attacked by the Mantis. He feels down remembering it. She finally receives her adventurer badge. Feeling excited, she tells Toru their badges look the same. She is proud she is finally an adventurer like him. Their walk is interrupted by clapping hands. They are greeted by the delinquent adventurers. While seemingly drunk, the leader congratulates Sora. The other adventurer reveals they are looking for a female companion. They encourage her to leave Toru, who is only a low-rank adventurer. They offer her guidance. Toru ignores them and asks Sora to ignore them. Annoyed, the leader attempts to punch him. He effortlessly dodges the attack. He then holds his shoulder, causing the delinquent leader to collapse into the ground. His teammates are enraged. They attack Toru as well, but he calmly blocks their hands. They also drop to the ground. Sora is amazed. He explains that he restored him to the state they were dead drunk. While they continue their walk, Toru asks her if it is really alright, warning her about more vile adventurers like the guys they encountered. Additionally, he cautions her about tough monsters she needs to fight moving forward. She enthusiastically reminds him that she wants to help him, and that she is happy to spend time with him again. She changes the subject and asks for his dreams. She insists that he tells her, and she will help him. He reveals that he wants to travel far away, as he is tired of walking through the same forest for the past 25 years, she asks if he regrets having the same life, but he immediately says no. He tells her that he still wants to continue adventuring. She reaches out to him and tells him to adventure together. While the sun sets, a solo adventurer finally finds a party. Toru and Sora arrive at the Goblin's Forest. He stands steadily, while he hears a horn rapidly drifting. An explosion from the ground erupted. A horned mole attacks from the earth. Sora feels extremely worried. He quickly dodges the beast's pointy horn. The horned mole launches in the air, while he strikes its neck with his sword. Still alive, the beast digs the ground. Sora thinks it runs away, but Toru says not yet. He asks her to use her item next time, when she gets a chance. She tells him to catch the horned mole next time. The beast burrows the earth. While they remain on guard, the wounded beast emerges again from the ground. Suspended in the air, it tries to attack him from behind. Sora keeps her eyes on the beast. She points her scepter and uses reverse. The horned mole's attack bounces back to it. While the beast lies unconscious on the ground, she asks if it is really a horned mole. Toru confirms, but he notes that she overdid her attack as the horn is gone. She apologizes, but he reassures her it is fine. He uses restoration on the beast. While still dead, the horn is restored. She asks if he revived the beast, but he explains it is impossible to restore a soul. He can only restore the body as it were when it was still alive. He cuts the horn from the beast. Toru uses the restoration again to get another horn. Sora commends his cleverness. He explains that their family is growing, so he needs extra income. He promises not to get caught. She is happy to hear him say family. After collecting horns, she commends his speed in dodging the attacks. He reveals that he is restoring his position. The more he gets used to it, the more agile he becomes. That said, she concludes why he has been touching his body. He suddenly touches her face gently. She blushes as she looks at him. He goes into a mental realm, looking at the skill tree. He sees the spatial perception skill, which understands the targeted space in detail. It is automatically activated, the effect is small, and the range is visual. He notes that her ability to see through his moves is too good, only to find out it is a skill after all. Sora closes her eyes, assuming a kiss again. But Toru continues to walk, leaving her behind. She gets annoyed, confusing him. She walks past him, feeling offended. He recounts that it would take 20 minutes to finish this task alone. But with Sora, it is no more than 3 minutes. With this, he feels positive that they will get deep into the forest soon. They take a rest in the forest. Sora is excited to eat her lunch. Upon taking a bite, she pauses and shouts that it is salty. She cleanses her palate with water. Toru explains how to eat the meat. First, he tells her to use a knife to cut thin slices, then wrap it around the cheese and biscuits. She asks him to warn her next time. She is finally pleased with the taste. While resting, he asks her if anything catches her attention on the way up. She notes the seamless path they took. She observes that the vines are trimmed, and the undergrowth is healthy, after being exposed to sunlight. He commends her for paying attention. He explains that outside the city, the goblin's forest was built as a logging area. Over time, adventurers like him created a safe path. They also cast out dangerous beasts. Presently, it has a logging road that leads to the center of the forest. Also, three logging sites that are known for its quality timber. She asks if adventurers are forest cleaners. While Tora thinks exterminator is a more appropriate term, 
He asks how many skill points are in her water jug presently. Since she defeated three monsters, she says three points. He corrects that she only gained one point. Since they defeated the bird and the mole together, no points were gained. She is surprised. He explains that skill points are divided by the number of battle participants and rounded down. That is why she only gained one point for the slime, which she defeated alone before lunch. He tells her it can be difficult. Silently, she looks at her food. She is touched to realize that Toru spent 25 years adventuring for her. She gives him a big hug. He recounts why he wants to go deeper into the forest today. She understands. After their skills cool down, he asks her to go to the goblins. They resume their walk in the forest. Sora and Toru are startled by the rustling noise surrounding the area. He explains that goblins work in groups of two or three to ambush their prey. He tells her to focus. Goblins appear from the bushes. One carries a wooden club while the other is barehanded striking an attack. Toru notices the goblin behind him. He swiftly dodges their attacks at once. He draws his sword and attacks one of them. The goblin is thrown into the ground, dumbfounding the others. The remaining goblins express their rage, while Toru stays focused. He pokes the goblin's eye with his sword. While the last one jumps to strike, he counterattacks, but the goblin dodges it. The monster strikes again, but Sora uses her reverse skill, wounding the goblin's face, she sighs with relief, making it in time. She mocks their appearance. Toru hands her a knife. He asks her to cut the goblin's right ear as proof of subjugation. Sora slashes as she is told. Next is the neck, below the jaw. He asks her to use her fingers to look for something hard. She follows. She successfully takes the mana stone out of the goblin's neck. She asks about the stone. He explains it is useless on its own not unless they combine it with other items using a mana stone tool. Further, he reveals that mana stone trade is one of the main pillars of the border town. He then encourages her to hunt as many goblins as possible before the sunset. She asks if they can take the goblins' meat home, but he thinks it is unappetizing to eat a humanoid's meat, so nobody buys it. While drooling, she thinks it is wasteful. Finally, they return to the border town. She joyfully sings after adventuring successfully, Carlos, one of the gatekeepers, teases Toru for being early. Sora politely greets him and thanks him for his work. He stutters as he sees her cute appearance. Carlos is dumbfounded, asking Toru who she is. He assumes that they are together by coincidence. She also thanks Carlos for taking care of Toru. The gatekeeper seems annoyed. He gets jealous of the old man Toru. Carlos asks the Rick and the other guard to comment. He refuses to respond. Toru tells Sora he will go to the butcher. While he asks her to deliver the body parts for assessment, she obliges. She lines up and notes there are many people. She overhears something on the side. Adventurers are talking about their near-death experience. Shisen, an adventurer, tells his companion that is what he gets for being impatient. While they talk, they notice Sora. One of them talks to her and commends her cuteness. She politely greets them and apologizes for eavesdropping. Hank, another adventurer, tells her it is okay, as his friend is loud anyway. She notices their difficulties in their quest. The loud adventurer explains that they are professionals, even though they don't seem like it. Sora introduces herself as a newbie. He seems pleased and invites her to join their party. He offers her help to slay goblins. His companion interrupts him, asking why he is suddenly inviting her. Toro arrives and asks Sora if she is done yet. She happily greets him. The loud adventurer is shocked. Toro apologizes and tells them he is with her. The other adventurers are dumbfounded. They finally arrive at the counter. Anna apologizes for keeping Sora waiting and asks about her experience. She tells the receptionist that she enjoyed her first adventure. She presents the body parts they gathered. The other adventurers can't believe their eyes. and that gives them their rewards as she runs down the items one by one for their subjugation quest. Tora grabs the sack of rewards and tells her to return home. Sora thanks the adventurers for inviting her to their party. She asks them for the secret to slaying the goblins next time they meet. Anna asks for the next adventurers in line. Looking like they are humbled, they present one goblin ear each to the receptionist. Toru and Sora happily lead the adventurer's office. Toru gives Sora a large copper coin as her share. She humbly refuses, telling him she already has enough items. He insists that she accepts the reward. Anyway, it is money he can't earn without her help. He also considers her needs to buy personal items. She seriously asks him if it is Toru's marriage funds, but he quickly says no. She excitedly asks him if they can check out the stalls. Surrounded by various food stalls, she asks him what he wants to eat. He suggests the bite-sized sharp beaks meat. Noting that the sauce is really good, she runs to try the food. 
While holding her food, he clarifies if she is really eating three of them. She says no, and offers one to him. He feels awkward. She feeds Toru, expressing his shyness. She looks happy, while gazing at him. She enjoys eating different foods from the stalls. Sora thoughtfully suggests they buy something for Ural, the landlady, as well. He agrees with her. While she eats, she hears a voice reminding her to slow down. It is Ural who arrives to meet them. Toru explains that he wants the landlady to take Sora elsewhere. Sora then realizes why they rounded up the hunt early. Ural takes them to the public bath. Sora notes that she has never been into one before. Toru thinks she needs a good bath after her first subjugation quest. Since he can't go inside, he asks the landlady to accompany her instead. But Sora doesn't care if they go in together. Toru gives him a strict look. Ural and Sora enter the public bath. As they enter, other women are also enjoying themselves inside. They undress and proceed to take a bath. Sora feels good in the hot spring with Ural. In the male public bathroom, Toru relaxes. He hears the commotion from the next room. Ural tells Sora she can't swim in the bathtub. He just smiles while he rests. After bathing, Toru waits outside the bathhouse. Sora thanks him for waiting. Feeling relaxed, she notes that her first public bath experience is amazing. She even notes her hair and skin becoming smooth. Toru agrees, complimenting her unrecognizable beauty. Ural interrupts him. She tells him that Sora seems to only own one piece of undergarment. They immediately go to a fabric shop. They are welcomed by the store owner. She recognizes Ural. The landlady asks for undergarments for Toru and Sora. She suggests two linen and one cotton fabric. Since the weather is getting hot, Toru lets her decide. The store owner says she has good fabric based on their preference. Sora asks if she can look around while she gets measured. Ural asks how long they need to wait. The store owner measures Toru next. She says after three days for Sora, while one day for him. Sora looks around the store, until something catches her attention. She looks closely at the fabric. Toru thinks she is having a stomach ache. She turns to him and asks which fabric is better. He points to the sky fabric, noting that it is her color. She agrees. She calls the store owner to buy said fabric with her own money. She says she can't get enough fabric with only 94 copper coins. Sora is surprised. Toru offers extra coins. He tells her not to worry, since he can earn more money with her next time. She thanks Toru, and tells him she loves him. Ural is happy to observe them. Sora uses the fabric, and wears it like a headband. Ural tells Toru, she is glad to see Sora feeling better. He reveals she is always like that, and asks her if she is bothering her. The landlady says no, and tells him it is just like his story. Feeling proud, he asks her if she feels Sora's brightness like no other. Although Ural hopes she takes it easy, he agrees while they observe Sora running happily. During an adventure, Toru tells Sora to watch out for an attack. She uses her reverse skill on two goblins, taking them down at once. They both fight goblins together like a good team. He slashes the last one, while she catches her breath. Since their first day of adventuring together, their subjugations keep increasing. While they keep goblins as their main targets, she asks him to use his restoration skill to handle the task. While adventuring, Sora sees a bitter grass that Toru mentioned before. He explains that it is the main ingredient for the blood-stopping ointment. He suggests selling it for a good prince since it doesn't grow in the city. He tells her just cut off the top of the stem so that it can quickly grow in three days. She gets an idea to get as many as possible. They just need to remember their location. But he explains that it only grows during the summer season. They arrive back to the border town. Carlos, the gatekeeper, rudely greets Toru as they walk past them. Rickon just gazes at them nonchalantly. Sora tells him they had a good haul today. He agrees, noting good enough to catch attention. An adventurer in fancy armor looks at them sternly. His name is Russell, wearing a silver plate B rank. He clarifies Toru's identity. While Rickon nods to confirm, surprisingly Carlos can't believe his senior's action. The B rank adventurer explains that Toru is accused of using Sora, a newbie adventurer, and that he pretends to be her guide. He asks them to follow him. Sora is worried, but he reassures her it will be over soon. They are escorted by guards as they leave. Angry, Carlos can't believe Rickon would tell the security department about Toru and Sora. Rickon asserts his dominance and tells Carlos to use honorifics. He argues that he is still his senior in their job as gatekeepers. Carlo rebuts asking how he can respect someone who sells out his friend. Rickon asserts that Toru is in violation. He also looks down on him for being a mud hunter. He punches Carlos, arguing that, unlike them, Toru has been working hard all his life. He notes Rickon's jealousy of Toru, enough to sabotage him. Enraged, Carlos tells him he is actually the one who is below anybody. 
However, Rickon reminds him of his mocking of Toro, but he defends himself, stating he is stubborn enough to even listen to his teasing. Rickon gets curious why he cares about Toro. He simply dodges his question as he recounts their days of adventuring together. Immersed in his thoughts, when Carlos was only a newbie adventurer, he reveals that Toro took care of him. He is dumbfounded why the security department would pull out a B rank for a guidance matter. Toru and Sora are still escorted by the guards and Russell. They arrive at a pavilion. Sora is surprised. Toru explains that it is pseudo-miasma formation, operated by monostone tools. Additionally, traditional martial arts and magic can't be activated unless your opponents are monsters. However, you will need to use your newly learned skills into combat. Sora realizes something about the training ground. Russell grabs a wooden sword. Toru asks if he can hear him out. He explains that he and Sora are a party since they come from the same village. He plans to make her a real adventurer instead of using her. Russell asks him to prove it by fighting him. Toru sighs in dismay. He agrees and asks for a wooden sword as well. His opponent tells him to do as he pleases. Toru carefully chooses his weapon. The B-rank adventurer tells him to hurry up. Still he can't decide. Toru asks if he can try his weapon as well. He is annoyed by Toru thinking he is mocking him. Russell hands his weapon to him. Toru feels the wooden sword. Finally, he finds the best weapon for him. The B-rank adventurer's annoyance intensifies. They face each other as their battle begins. Russell gets in position. The guards note the immediate increase of his fighting spirit. They explain that he possesses the full spirit ability, a skill from the flame of God, Raflet. Russell declares that he will bring Toru down in one blow. The latter tells Sora to take a good look. She obliges. Nonchalantly, he notes that a B-rank like him will confront him alone. Russell's anger intensifies as he clenches his teeth. He mocks Toru's low rank. Suddenly, Russell is startled as he can't use his martial arts. Calmly, Toru charges at him. He tries to block his attack, but Toru strikes another slash, landing a direct hit on him. Russell slams his knee to the ground. Weakened, he expresses his frustration. The guards are anxious to see his poor state. While Toru points his sword at Russell, he bids farewell thinking the match is done. He leaves with Sora, but Russell suddenly feels strange. He notices that his skill, the fighting spirit, is back. Enraged, he uses his raging fire strike. Toru calls Sora. She immediately uses her reverse skill, causing the flame to bounce back into Russell. He screams in agony as he burns. The guards immediately go to him while they get water to put out the fire. Toru nonchalantly leaves the scene with Sora. Afterwards, they go to town for dinner. She asks him what he did back then. Recounting the battle, Sora notices Russell's surprise when he first lifted his sword, which did not burn. She notes Toru's deliberate attitude. It was her first time seeing him mock someone. He explains that when he touched Russell's sword, he restored his skill tree. Sora is amazed, immersed in his mental realm. He notes his inspiration for his skill development upon seeing his and Sora's skill tree. He thinks that if the past can be seen, he wonders if the skill tree can be restored. That said, he tried to shorten his restoration branch a little bit. As a result, the skill point which should have been used returned too. Sora asks if he can restore the skill tree as he prefers, and extend other branches he likes. Toru confirms the logic. However, he notes a problem with this thinking. He notes that the skill tree only has one branch. Sora feels disappointed. He admits that he can't frequently use it, as others may figure out the trick. Sora realizes the reason why he made Russell angry, so he would not notice. Toru reveals that it only worked because it was a sword fight. When he first handed the wooden sword, he restored the branches to seal the martial arts. But in the end, he changed it back upon tapping his shoulder. The night has already set in. Sora asks him what he will do if they come back. He thinks that the violation was only an excuse. They probably stood out because their hunt suddenly increased. So he suggests slowing down for now. Additionally, he explains that the adventurer's world is based on ability. If one has a strong reputation, troublesome people will follow. Sora worries that women will follow him if they learn about this strength. He immediately asks her to stop. However, he has an idea who has sent Russell to them. It is bothersome, but he will pay them a visit soon. She asks if it is a woman, but she is wrong. Toru walks at night as people drink and musicians play. He enters the Tavern Choice Bar. He is welcomed inside the bar with adventurers as customers. Stracia and Nenesa greet him. Toru naughtily greets her back as he gazes at her scars. Stracia, an a rank adventurer, teases him for ignoring him and being playful with Nenesa. Toru lightly jokes why the Platinum Flames, who are the top two adventurers, drink in a mediocre bar. Stracia humors him. 
He reminds Taurus they are close because they have the same master. A big pint of beer arrives. Taurus asks for round potatoes and sausages. His smoking hot meal immediately arrives. He eats his delicious meal and jugs his bear. Taurus commends the bartender. Their master, who is named Dadden, suddenly expresses his anger in the corner. His disciples notice him. Dadden, currently the adventurer bureau director, preaches about spending money wisely. Sacco, who is the vice director, argues with him. He reports that the finances 30% goes to the army's subjugation expenses alone. Dadden acknowledges they do not have enough money, not even to spend for the outer wall repair. Sacco conveys he can't ask for more funding as well. If their strategy works, it might help them solve their monetary issues. Stracia translates that it is a good idea, shining a light on the fallen ruins. Toru asks Nenesa to explain it to him. She interprets that the recapture of Basalia's northern district that fell last year is tomorrow. He realizes why and B ranks filled the adventurer's bureau this morning. Dadden strongly opposes a gambling-like strategy. He expresses the importance of training. Sacco explains that he is not hesitant about rookies, as long as their talent is also paired with an excellent user. Dadden asks him why he picked a fight with Toru through Russell. Noting he did not properly choose the means, he encourages Toru to speak up, which is the reason why he is here. Sacco points out Sora and her reversal skill. He commands him to let go of her. Toru nonchalantly gazes at him and asks him to leave them alone. Sacco ignores to discuss. He advised partnering with strength to avoid being pulled down by weakness. Nenesa reminds his uncle to be careful with his words. Suddenly, his gaze intensifies. He asks her niece what happened to her scars on her neck. She looks at her scars, and they are really gone. She is in disbelief. Stracia looks with suspicion. While Tor drinks his beer, the former removes his eye patch. He displays his cursed magic eyes. While he investigates Toru's abilities, he apologizes and admits to his actions. Stracia laughs at Toru's low resistance for confessing quickly. Nenesa, calling Stracia Prince, asks him to hold back a little. She asks Toru for clarification. He reveals that his restoration skill achieved the highest level. He jokingly asks her if she wants her scars back. She expresses her gratitude for him. Sacco calms down. He asks him what other things he can do, aside from curing old wounds. He simply answers various things. Sacco then asks Dadden to retire from his position, noting his old age. Annoyed, Dadden refuses his proposal. Toru suddenly orders foods and another beer. Sternly, Dadden tells them to keep the discussion serious. Suddenly, Sacco is dumbfounded at the director. As the stew boils, everyone but Toru is rendered speechless. Sacco praises his skill, as well as his arrogance. Dadden is confused with what is happening. Nenesa points out his head. His confusion intensifies. Dadden's hair suddenly grows back. Toru makes him look young, contrary to Sacco's comment earlier. Enraged, he can't believe that he really raised his useless skills level. He admits that his competence is only to make their mouths shut. He suggests bringing him to the interrogation room. He worries about the priests if this skill becomes public. He notes that it will be troublesome if more people know they can grow their hair back. He thinks of locking himself at home. While he blames his favorite disciple Toru, Stracia jokingly notes that their master's retirement destination is decided. He suggests that they enjoy the night to the fullest. While his meal is served, Toru declares he has two conditions. The first is not to meddle with him and Sora. The second is eliminating those interfering with them. Sacco asks what they will get in return. He thinks carefully. He confidently asks for half a year, and he can become like Dadden and Sacco. Stracia and Nenesa look so proud of him. Sacco notes his big words for a low rank like him, but he thinks that he can achieve his goal faster if he hands Sora over to him. However, Toru disagrees. Even if he is good at moving people, he lacks talent in nurturing them. His exceptional talent results in his high standards. In fact, there are no more ranks, apart from the Platinum Flame in the past two years. Dadden is amused by his favorite disciple. Sacco rebuts and mocks the greatly cherished Dadden for causing early retirement. While he eats, Toru informs them he does not want to cause trouble. Instead, he just wants to continue what he is doing. Dadden notes his lack of greed. He suggests that Toru retires as an adventurer and comes to his place. He responds that he is still active, but if he insists, he will follow him. His master understands that he still wants to be an adventurer. He asks how long he plans to do it. Taurus wants to continue until he can. Lastly, he reiterates his declaration to become like Dadden and Sacco. He recounts the tale of the two adventurers regaining the Earth, who sealed the great miasma hole of the underground labyrinth. Dubbed as the great hero, Stracia expresses his approval and respect of Tor's ambition. 
While Nenesa looks forward to his goal happening, the three disciples share a toast. Dadan expresses his full support, while he promises to take care of the troubles. Sako looks sternly at him. Immersed in his thoughts, he thinks Torug is still hiding something about his abilities, recounting how he defeated Russell. He also believes that it is bad for Dadan to side with him. Sako formally approves Toru's conditions. He will also order his subordinates to stop meddling with him and Sora, but he wants a progress report from him to some extent. Toru is pleased as he accepts his proposal. Done with his agenda, he drops a copper coin. He bids farewell to them, while Dadan expresses his disapproval of him leaving, but they can't stop him. Toru finally leaves the bar. Sako asks the director if it is okay to let him lead easily. He notes his stubbornness and his difficulty admitting defeat. He disregards what he just said, making Dadan pay attention. Instead, Sako wonders how he will enter his own house with new hair. Two giant caterpillars are tied in ropes. The butcher notes their giant haul today. Toru asks her to sell one whole, while split the remaining in small portions. Sora expresses her hunger. She asks him to return early, and grill the caterpillar meat. He asks him not to rush, as there is a place he wants to stop by. He tells her that they will be delighted, to see the amount of meat they bring. Sora is confused about their destination. He brings her to the alley where the cats live. Sora feels anxious, but he tells him it is fine. He unwraps the meat. The two cats immediately appear and run towards them. He apologizes for arriving late. Sora realizes now what he meant by they. He shares that he often feeds them. However, it has been a while since the last time. She pets and talks to them while they eat, but he warns her, noting that they hate being touched while eating. But the black cat adores her. Toru is surprised. The other cat turns sweet as well to her. He feels jealous after feeding them for half a year just to get their affection. While she admires the cats, Sora thinks they are delicious. Toru attempts to touch the cat. While Sora notes it will not be delicious if they eat scrawny meat, suddenly she feels strange. She senses that they are being spied on, but he is busy talking to the cats until Sora catches something. She holds a stray child wearing a worn-out shirt. Toru is surprised. She asks if the kid lives around the alley. Still in shock, he asks the kid if he is the third one. Moo, the stray kid, says she is not delicious even if Sora eats him. She makes sure she will not do that. Moo echoes something delicious that she heard earlier. Suddenly, her stomach rumbles. Her eyes are on the meat. She immediately rushes toward the food. Toru quickly grabs her. He asks if he has been eating cat food all along. Moo insists on eating the meat. He asks the kid's parents' whereabouts. He tells him that he can't deal with homeless kids anymore. But Sora grabs his arm. She displays a charming expression. He changes his mind and will asks for the landlady's permission. Sora is pleased. She hopes that they get along with Moo. The kid asks them what their plan is with her. She entices her with delicious food. Moo seems to agree. Sora says it is decided. Then she introduces herself and Toru. Moo calls her big sister. While he can't complete Toru's name, the cats gaze at them. Mu calls him too, telling him she is hungry. But Toru tries to correct him, and he teaches her how to pronounce his name. They arrive at Ural's boarding house. The landlady notices Turo and Sora bring home guests. He apologizes to her. He notes that they become attached to him. Toru asks her if they can take shelter for a while. Ural approves his request, and she offers to warm up the bath for Mu. She follows up the food with him. He tells her they need to clean her first. Sora asks him if they can clean her with restoration skill. Toru tries to look into her, but he can't find any of her records. He thinks he has not encountered any monsters yet. Sora gives her best in cleaning up Mu. She feels ticklish while they give her a bath. She enjoys freshening up. Toru finds it strange as he can't see any fleas on her. Sora realizes that even the cats don't have fleas as well. Silently, Toru feels worried about Mu's scratches on her back. Sora notices Mu's purple eyes. She explains that it is the purple eye tribe's characteristic. They observe her eyes closely. Toru mentions that they have natural night visions. While calling her Munu, Yurul arrives with her old clothes their new guest. Sora corrects her, telling her name is only Mu. But Toru informs her that it is also correct, based on their tribe's custom. He explains that males from their tribe use the same later continuously in their names, while females use two pairs of repeated syllables. Sora concludes that her name could be something like Lelamu or Mumu. Mu dresses up and asks Toru how she looks. He compliments her appearance. She looks happy. Finally, their meal is already prepared. Sora expresses how hungry she is. Mu asks permission if she can eat already. He nods as confirmation. She savors her bite of the meat. He reminds her to chew her food properly and that no one will steal it. 
Sarah agrees with Mu. Nothing that Thymi is the best. She asks Toru to go hunting tomorrow. Just like a parent, he tells her not to eat so hurriedly. He asks her to drink water. She follows him. While they enjoy dinner, Yuro wishes that Toru could encounter these kids earlier. She notices Sora gazing at her with curiosity. She apologizes for observing late, but she asks about the landlady's long ear tips. She reveals that she is from the Ashen Ear tribe. Sora confirms her assumption that she is from another country. Tora explains that Ural is from the north. Their ears became longer to pick up sounds better on the snowscape. She corrects him, saying it is so they will not miss the teachings of the ice god, Strajan. She also adds they are often teased as grey rabbits. She recounts a large country in the middle of the continent long ago. It had a high technological civilization. Also, people lived a peaceful and prosperous life. However, the country was swallowed up by a huge hole in the ground a hundred years ago. As a result, various monsters appeared from the Great Abyss, causing the civilization's demise. With this, refugees scattered to what was then the remote frontier regions. Ural asks if Sora has limited knowledge about other countries. She confirms. Toro explains that they grew up in the remote countryside of Central. The landlady offers to share her knowledge with Sora. She gladly accepts her offer. Various civilizations emerged. The people were blessed with the spiritual powers of the Six Gods is jointly governed by six great powers. He notes that they don't normally visit their village. While it is now clear for Sora why some have horns or scales, Ural then asks Toro about his plans. She teases and calls him a father, referring to the situation with Mu. Initially, he plans on feeding her then kicking her out. However, he decides to look after her for a little longer. Her purple eyes remind him of his master Dandan, who took care of him as a child. Ural looks at him with admiration. They continue enjoying dinner. In an armor shop, Ramu, who is the owner, welcomes Toru. He tells him to make an order. He rants about some weapon owners neglecting their equipment. So he commends Toru's diligence for taking care of his equipment. Passionately, he asks him about his order. He asks for a pair of shoes. Ramu notices that the order is for the little kid. He asks Sora and Mu to greet Ramu, noting that he may be scary, but his skill is top-notch. Sora introduces herself as his future wife. Surprised, he asks Toru when did he get married and have a child. In his defense, he tells him that he is just looking after his acquaintance's daughter, and he just picked up the child yesterday. Ramu thinks carefully. He asks Mu, which he mistaken for a boy, to take his foot's shape. He outlines Mu's fit on a leather. He tells him he will leave some space, so she can still use it when she grows bigger. Mu asks Toru what it is for. He explains that shoes keep her feet from getting dirty. He asks Ramu to make soft, something that feels like a cat's law. The owner tells him he will use something light. Toru asks about the cape that got cancelled. It was made of hippo leather. Ram remembers it as the one he failed to sell. He then asks Toru if he plans to bring Mu with him. Suddenly, the shop owner gestures his thumb to point outside. Mu asks Toru what does the gesture mean. Sora says it means to go outside. Privately, Ramu expresses his frustration with Teru. The shop owner tells him he does not want to waste orders, noting that Mu looks like she will not last long as an adventurer. Toru explains that she is talented, despite being small. Ramu observes the girls through the window. Tor holds a worn-out armor. He asks him not to tell anyone what he is about to show him. Ramu says not to it, until Tor uses its restoration skill, fixing the armor. He observes it and notes that he can't see any damage. Inside the store, Ramu can see genturing with his hands. Mu notices and asks what it means. Sora says it means he gives up. Toru explains to him that it is his skill. Ramus can't believe it. He pats him in the back, congratulating him, but gets to thinking as his job might get redundant. Toru assures him that he will continue to be an adventurer with the girls. He also informs the show owner that it can also work on humans. So he asked him again if we can take his orders. Ramus is finally convinced promising him to create a great product for Mu. Toru continues to repair, while mentioning the other subject. He restores the leather of the armor. Ramu sees that even the damages of the hippo leather also disappeared. He is amazed by how detailed the restoration is. Toru explains that his restoration power can replace missing parts. He is amazed and expresses his gratitude for Toru. He also asks Ramu for dragon skin armor, in case he can get one. But he thinks it is easy to get. He offers a rare ferret leather instead. Toru reveals the limitations of his skill, recounting the time he cut the horn of the horned mole. He says that only 30% of his target's missing parts can be restored. Case in point, he can't restore the smallest part of the horn. He suspects that it is because the brain can't recognize it as part of a larger hole anymore. Ramu concludes he needs bigger armor, so he can restore as much. 
but he assures Toru he can manage with his connections. The two finally come into an agreement. Sora and Mu continue to watch through the window. In the Adventurer Bureau, a party of adventurers discuss. They find out Toru is actually amazing. Rickle agrees, hearing about the rumor that he set a B-rank adventurer on fire. Rickle shares that he also heard that Sora possessed a rare skill. The young adventurer remembers her as the cute one. They are surprised to see who arrives. Tor and the girls visit the Adventurer Bureau. They are confused why they carry a child with them. Rickle thinks that Mu is with Sora, but they do not seem related, no matter how they look. The young adventurer hears Mu's calling Toru father. They are confused by them. They even suspect it is a remarriage, hence the child. Toru reminds Mu to be quiet as he introduces the place to her. Mu recognizes the place, noting that Ural mentioned his job to her. As her senior, Sora offers to show Mu around. The kid starts to get curious. She points at the adventurer board. Sora explains that adventurers write what they want, or something they want to do together. Mu asks if she can write as well on the board. Toru confirms. She tiptoes as she tries to reach the word. He lifts her, providing help. She looks happy. While she starts to chalkboard, she seemingly draw a family portrait. Toru asks about her drawing. She points Toru and her first. Sora thinks she is one of the smaller drawing, but Mu says they are the cats, Kiro and Shima. Shidi asks the kid if she is the last image next to Toru. Mu says it is Ural. Checking if she is done, they ask them to head over the counter. Sora protests that she is not in the portrait. At the counter, the receptionist looks carefully at the paper. She asks if the kid is just all right to register, given her age of nine years old. Toru clarifies the minimum age requirement to be an adventurer as eighth years old. He reassures her that Mu is a magician, noting she does not need to keep close with the monsters. However, she can't permit his registration. Toru asks why. She explains that the Purple Eye Tribe has no lower brand offensive skill. It is believed that Mu's initial skill is the rare electric sense. Using set magic to detect monsters is not enough for her growth as an adventurer. That said, she can't allow Mu's registration. Taurus clarifies if it is because she can't get a skill point with electric sense. She confirms. He confidently reassures her it is not a problem, and she will understand upon Mu's test. The receptionist looks anxious. She then asks Mu to place her hand over the soul analyzer. She reaches to it. Her skill tree appears in the crystal ball. They wait for the analyzer to show the results. Mu possesses an electric spine skill. Toru explains that it is a skill that counters an opponent's attacks, noting she can get a skill point with her skill. While she stutters, the receptionist thinks they are fine. She prepares Mu's adventurer tag. Mu looks at Toru as she raises her hand. They shake hands, a gesture she learned from the armory shop. Her adventurer tag is finally done. With this, they can finally go hunting. He looks for Sora, only to find out she is drawing herself on the family portrait. She finishes adding herself on the board. Mu gazes at her drawing. Toru informs her they are done. Occupied, she doesn't even notice. The adventurer board now displays a complete family portrait. Mu displays her preparation. She uses her electric spine skill. Sora is amazed, describing her skill beautifully. Toru explains Mu's skill and its ability to counter attacks. Mu tells him her itching stops after using the skill. Sora thinks all her fleas are gone. Toru touches Mu's head, analyzing her skill tree. Its current level is one. She can use it five times an hour. Current status is weak. Duration is five minutes. While range is only around the user, he remains in the skill tree's realm. When he uses restoration on the electric spines branch, the bump returns to level zero. He notes that she had this skill when she was born, and she has a total of three bumps. Toru also notices a seemingly round flower bud. He asks Mu to look at his eyes for the next step. Sora clarifies what he said. Suddenly, she senses being spied again just like in the alley. Mu turns quiet. He asks her why the change in mood. Mu asks if he is mad at her. Sora consoles her, while Toru reassures her that he will not get mad. Rather, he is happy she wants to use her skill. She asks him if he means it. Toru is on bended knee and gives her permission to look. Mu is relieved and gazes at him. She enters her own skill tree realm with him. Mu notes the weird tree that grows. He is happy it went well. He asks what she sees down by the roots. She looks at the round thing. He explains that it is her special characteristic, sense sharing. It is a skill enabling her to share feelings and senses with her target. He recounts her expression before. He suspects that because of her fear to use her skill, she ended up living with cats. He notes that it is difficult to find someone living with a soul instrument. People around her must have seen her evil. He asks if she is fine. She gives him a big hug as a response. Sora watches in the corner. 
They go into the skill tree realm again. He asks if she can see the three bumps on the trunk. She confirms. He instructs her to pour water on the roots, elevating the middle bump. She follows his instruction. A branch suddenly grows. The new skill is electric radar. It shows the direction and distance of enemies in the surroundings. He encourages her to use it. She closes her fists, and she concentrates. Mu releases electricity around her. The lightning bolts spread across the area. She senses something in the corner. Toru asks them to have a look. Sora asks what is going on. She is curious how Mu can use two skills now. She expresses her confusion with him. She is surprised to learn Mu's three skill bumps. Mu locates the area she sensed. They find a slime. Toru carries her to help her hunt the slime. He instructs her to impale the spinning core. She lands a direct hit. They are happy about Mu's first hunt. She asks Toru for validation. He confirms she did great. Silently, he thinks that the restricted skill is convenient. Sora pats her head, while jokingly expresses her competitiveness. Mu Kami gazes at her. Toru praises her, but warns her of the next training. She tells him not to worry. They go back to the skill tree realm. He holds the trunk while they prepare the water jug. He instructs her to make the top bump bigger. She follows his instruction. She gains the thunder needle skill, which enhances speed and agility of the user's body. He asks her to try her new skill out. She concentrates. She screams thunder, while bolts surround her. She swiftly jumps. Sora feels anxious that it hurts Mu. While tossing a rock, he asks her if she feels any pain. Mu tells him she is fine, although it feels weird. He then throws a rock at her. He instructs her to dodge them, she effortlessly dodges the first throw, until multiple rocks come falling, but she manages to dodge them all smoothly. Toru continues to throw rocks, but she consistently displays her speed and agility. Sora praises her for dodging all the rocks. Mu feels proud for awakening a new skill. Toru commends her for exceeding his expectations. He pats her head as he feels proud of her. Toru then asks her if she can share the skill with him. She is happy to do so. However, she is clueless how to do it. He informs her about the opposite of sharing sense. She clarifies. Silently, he wonders why those cats had no fleas. Leaving Mu's tingling aside, he ponders why the cats are not in the same state as her. She clarifies that the cats are always together. He agrees and asks her to share with him. She displays a stern gaze. Bolts emerge from Toru's body. He asks her to close her eyes and cover her nose and ears, focusing to transfer the effect of the thunder needle to him. She feels doubtful at first, but she concentrates again, following his instructions. Toru feels something, successfully transferring the skill to him. He and Mu run around the forest together. He tosses her as they bond. Sora just observes in the corner. Toru and Mu get ready for another adventure, while Sora stops them. She expresses her feeling left out. Mu tells her it is still too early for her. She insists it is not. She asks Mu to share the skill with her as well. Mu ignores her. She tells Toru she is hungry. He gives her an apple. It is nighttime already when they return to the Adventurer's Bureau. They present their spoils to the receptionist for assessment. She is impressed by the amount of their hunt. Silently, he notes that electric radar and thunder needle skills help them finish their quests faster. Mu sleeps while she piggybacks on Toru. The receptionist gives them their rewards. As the party leaves, the receptionist is surprised. She observes that Toru's party has increased their goblin hunting numbers, unlike other parties who are not doing well. She gets suspicious with the number of hunts they present, wondering how they can spot so many goblins. While carrying Mu, he notes that hunting all day must be tiring for her. Sora is impressed by her. She notes her ability to switch skills, and learning to use them quickly. She compares it when she uses her skill three times, exhausting her. Toru reassures her that they have different situations. Also, their kind of magic plays a role in it. He recounts Mu's electric thorns that repelled the fleas. He thinks she probably increased her power by targeting herself. He cheers her up, highlighting the advantages of her inversion skill. Sora offers to take turns in carrying Mu. She worries he is feeling tired. He thanks her, saying he is fine for now. She expresses he can depend on her. After all, she wants to get closer with Mu. He notes that she does not seem to like Sora. He suspects that he used her sense-sharing skill to someone Sora's age, and the result was unfavorable. That said, he advises to take things easy. She appreciates Toru's guidance. Suddenly, he remembers he has a request. She excitedly listens. He asks if she slept with the cats last night. She confirms, saying they joined her. He suggests doing an exchange, Mu for the two cats. She recounts that the cats went to Mu, then his door first. But in the middle of the night, they scratched her door. While unsure, he thinks that is how it was. Sora thinks of an idea. She proposes that Mu and the cats sleep in her room. 
Then she can sleep in his room. He passes on her proposal, stating that his bed is too small. She protests, saying he can sleep anywhere.